This whole Bitcoin halving narrative, I've spent a long time looking at it. In audio. And I think it's factually incorrect. Interesting. It is, it is actually the business cycle, which is quite extraordinary. And it's uh, best represented by M2. So global M2, year on year, is the same as Bitcoin year on year, basically. Mm -hmm. Except Bitcoin overshoots on the upside. Mm -hmm. So it comes off the, actually off the scale because it's an exponential adoption asset. It's got Metcalfe's law to it. Mm -hmm. So what you find is in the bull market, it outperforms where M2 should be. In the bear market, it exactly follows it. Mm -hmm. And so then I thought, huh, what's going on here? And I, I just wrote a thesis on this because I just suddenly figured it out. I got on my Bloomberg a chart of the ISM survey. And I'm like, I've been looking at this for 30 years. I'm like, it looks really cyclical now. I mean, like, like clockwork cyclical. So on Bloomberg, you got this cycles finder. So I put it on and every top is exactly three and a half years. And all the bottoms match. Every top is every time Bitcoin tops. And then I started doing the work and I realized what I think has happened is the global business cycle is just a refi cycle because everybody in the world's reset their rates at zero in 2009. <laughs> and at most debt is between three and five years. So you get this three and a half year cycle, right. which is a refi cycle. So right now, the problem is, is if we got rates of bloody 5%, there's not enough money to cover it. So the economy slows down, etc. So it feels that Bitcoin, all the crypto market is liquidity flow plus adoption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once I discovered that, it just so happens that Bitcoin was launched at exactly the same time as zero rates. You know, I, I looked at this for a long time and you know, talked to Plan B about this. And I'm like, directly, it, it seems fine. I don't have a problem with it and it doesn't have to be perfect. But it's like, but where's the demand side of that equation? Because it's only a supply story. And every yeah. time I look at people in commodity markets who just use supply, which is a lot of people, they always it up because demand is actually the more important equation. Audio. The other thing I, I learned was having been in Bitcoin since 2013 is ridden the cycle up and down. So taken the, the joys and the pain and then rode it all the way back up in 2017. In audio. Got out too early into the mayhem when it was at 2000. I was up 10x. I thought I was a god. Yeah. Went up another 10x. Then right. it collapsed. And then I bought it back. I thought brilliantly in, in April 2020 but I'd sold out at 2,000. I bought back at 6,500. I'm like, moron, why don't you just keep it? Yeah. And buy more in the low and I would have done a lot better. I, I went and did the whole maths and how much better I would have done, even though I traded it really well, theoretically. I would have done 5X better just by holding it. And if I had doubled my position, my original stake at the low, I would have been something like 15 or 20 times more than I made. I'm like, okay. So that's, I've used that framework. It's like, okay, fine. Just find whatever liquidity you can when it does this. Yeah. And you tend to get the higher expected future returns. Basically speaking, we'll all be okay if it goes up from here. You know, another couple of cycles with this 3X versus the previous high, everyone will be just fine. You don't need to be the richest person in the world. You can still be surfing in Hawaii or scuba diving in the Cayman Islands and not have to focus on all of it. So that's kind of how I think about it. But everybody always wants to target. In the back of my mind, when I first started this, I wrote the first ever macro strategy piece on Bitcoin. And I just compared it above ground supply of gold and known reserves and mm -hmm. just backed into Bitcoin and said, roughly speaking with gold at, I think it was about 1300 bucks at the time. I said, equivalence basis, Bitcoin's worth a million dollars. And I've always stuck with that as that's probably the kind of, you know, yeah, right kind of target. Pal encourages investors to have an abundance mindset and not worry about the market like it's in a conflict. He also shares his bullish outlook for crypto and discusses how it will perform in the days and weeks to come. It's a terrible narrative, but it is like a digital gold. It's a fixed asset that, that does one thing right now. Yes, we've got these ordinals and a few other things, but I just don't see that really getting traction. So that is not the same network. If you think of Metcalfe's law, it's not only the number of connections on the network, but the interconnected between them, i.e. everything you build on top. Right. And each has that written large everywhere. Right. So there is almost in no world, if that continues, the Bitcoin stays as is, the, you know, the Bitcoin maximalist perfect thing. It can't be as big as ETH, just mathematically impossible. And that's okay. Yeah. People kind of, they worry about that like it's some war. It's not, so, you know, it's a, just have an abundance mindset and everybody's fine. What do you think of the Sol ETH chart then? 
super bullish on that one. If that breaks here, it's still messing around, but yeah, if it breaks that level, it just feels to me that it's Solana will outperform ETH, will outperform yeah. Bitcoin, and something else will outperform Solana, but yeah. it becomes harder for me. I just don't have the ability to figure out what that will be, you know, because we've got new stuff like Sui and we've got other stuff coming up, you know, I don't know, but but those three charts are really interesting to me. When you step back, and I keep trying to get people to think this, it's a long-term ad adoption curve, and we only just started. We're at 300 million people, and we will get to 3 billion people over time. So you need to think of things as a long-duration asset, and you just size it accordingly. Now, depending how much risk you want to take, and, and that's it. But we'll get so obsessed. I mean, yes, I look at hourly charts next to me on my Bloomberg of ETH and everything else. I don't trade at all. I never buy it, never sell it. Occasionally I'll make a switch. So if the salt ETH chart really breaks and I've got some yeah. conviction, I'll switch some of my ETH into salt. That's all I that's all I ever do. I don't even trade it, even though I've got hourly charts and I'm watching it right. like a crack addict for no reason. I think what we'll see because of adoption curves and how they always play out is a decreasing rate of change. Yeah. yeah. And what you'll end up doing is naturally switching into another asset if you're driven by performance. There's a whole bunch of Bitcoin maxis who aren't. They're driven by idealism, and that's fine. But for me, it's about, you know, why did I make the switch from Bitcoin into ETH? It was just that the ETH adoption curve for such a large asset was so much faster. So I think what adoption curve for such a large asset was so much faster. So I think... In this video, Pal discusses his bullish outlook for crypto and how it will perform in the days and weeks to come. He also shares his thoughts on the Bitcoin narrative and why he believes it is factually incorrect. Pal believes that the Bitcoin market is cyclical and that the current cycle is driven by the global business cycle. He also believes that Bitcoin is a digital gold and that it has the potential to reach a value of $1 million. Pal is bullish on Ethereum and Solana, and he believes that they will outperform Bitcoin in the days and weeks to come. He also believes that there will be a decreasing rate of change in adoption curves over time, and that investors will naturally switch into other assets as they become more mature. Overall, Pal is optimistic about the future of crypto and believes that it is a long-term adoption curve. He encourages investors to have an abundance mindset and to not worry about the market like it's in a conflict.